I'm really, really delighted to be hosting today, tonight Telmo Piavani. He is a professor in the Department of Biology at the University of Padua in Italy, where he holds the first Italian chair of philosophy of biological sciences. Previously, he served as professor of the philosophy of science at the University of Milan, Bicocca. Uh, he is past president of the Italian Society of Evolutionary Biology, and is currently a fellow of several academic institutions and scientific societies, including fellow of the Scientific Board of Science Festivals in Italy, and fellow of the International Scientific Council of Muse in Trento. He's a member of the editorial boards of Evolution, Education, and Outreach, Evolutionary Biology, Rendiconti Lincei, uh, uh, Nature Italy, <laughs> the Instituto Trecani, and the Italian edition of Scientific American. He's author of more than 300 publications, including a robust list of books that includes Introduction to Philosophy of Biology, the Theory of Evolution, Born to Believe, and with Girotto and uh, Vajotidiara, The Unexpected Life, Homo Sapiens, The Great History of Human Diversity, published in 2011, Introduction to Darwin, 2012, The End of the World, 2012, Freedom of Migration, 2016, How We Will Be in 2016, Imperfection and Natural History, published by MIT Press in 2019, in the, in the English translation, which I had the pleasure of reading and reviewing. The, the Earth After Us in 2019, Finitude of 2020, Serendipity uh, in 2021, which is also coming out in an English translation soon, and Nature is Bigger Than Us, 2022. He is director of PICAI, the Italian website dedicated to evolution, and director of the University of Padua's web magazine, Il Bo Live. He is also a columnist for Il Corriere della Sera and the magazines Le Scienze and Micromedia. <laughs> Please help me welcome <laughs> Telmo de <Dottor. laughs> Thank you so much, Anwar. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Don't be afraid about my, ex my expertise. It's simpler than expected. I'm an evolutionist, so it's a great pleasure to be here. It's my first time in Maine and my first time in Portland. And it's also a great pleasure because it's a preview because I'm going to coming back to the United States. I work for some years at the American Museum of Natural History, and, and in February I will be back as associate scientist there. So I hope to come back to, to, to visit you again. And, okay, I'm an evolutionist, so I, I study change. I study model of change in biology, in culture, in technologies. And, but, but I also, I'm also a philosopher of science. So I, I, I put together science, natural sciences and humanities. So it's, uh, it's good for me to be in a center for global humanities like, like this one. So it's a great pleasure. I decided to, together with Anwar, to, to talk about a quite strange topic for, for evolution, so imperfection because it's related to my book published by MIT Press and, and, and two, two years ago. But I think it's a funny way to explain, to share with you some ideas about how evolution works, how really evolution works. And, and I, I will show you some ideas against challenging some functionalist or ableist idea, ideas about, about how nature works. And my first image, image will be exactly this one. So because when you watch on the TV, Docu films, or natural docu films, or the commentaries related to uh, animal behaviors, they don't tell you that this is how the hunting ends up for many predators in 95% of, of the cases. So I will, I will show you, I will talk about the 90% of the imperfection that we see in nature, because always, quite always, they present to you just a successful story, just a successful uh, uh, version of the story. But, ev but evolution is trade-offs, evolution is compromise, evolution is suboptimality, it's nothing related to perfection. And I would like to explain to you why now we know that. Uh, let me, because we are in a global, in a center for global humanities, let me start with a quotation in Italian, sorry for that, but this is a masterpiece in Italy, is this, is a, is a page, this is a page from the, 
uh, the masterpiece by Galileo Galilei, the dialogue about the, the great systems and the dialogue in which Galileo decided to present a, a scientific revolution, not in a technical paper, but in a theater piece. Because if you, if you know this masterpiece, it's a theater piece in which you have an actor playing uh, the, 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 the Copernican uh, version and against the Aristotelian and so on. And this is a passage in the first um, section of, of this masterpiece in which Galileo is saying, I don't know why people continue to think that something in order to be noblest, in order to be admi ad admirable, has to be perfect, has to be uh, without alterations, mutations, and generations. I think in a, exactly in a contrary sense. I think that the most creative things in the world are the most imperfect things, like, like our Heard, I, like our planet that, that seems like a living organisms, in its, in its imperfection, you can find life, you can find change, you can find very interesting things. And, and Galileo uh, says, when you see something perfect like crystal or sand or uh, jasper, nothing grows on, on crystal. Everything grows on imperfection of things. So it's a wonderful quotation. So we can say that one of the two founders of the, of the modern science told about imperfection. And also the other one, Charles Darwin, uh, told about imperfection. According to Darwin, imperfection is central in order to explain evolution. Why? This is a quite funny passage in, a, in, in the private correspondence by Darwin. In this, in, in this letter, he is exchanging ideas with one of his um, scholars, student, Ernest Ekel in Germany. And Ernest Ekel uh, tried to found a new discipline that, that uh, in a provocative way, he uh, called distiliology. So the, the study of everything useless in evolution, functionless, rudimentary organs in animals and plants. So it was, it was a joke that, shared, that, that he shared with Darwin. And Darwin uh, replied in an enthusiastic way in, in, in April 1867, your whole, whole discussion, and please see the Freudian mistake, because uh, uh, Ernest Ekel was telling about this teleology that means something without any finalistic, without any direction, without any goal. And Darwin wrote this theology, so something related to against theology. So it was a Freudian mistake in, 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 in. anyway, the meaning is clear. So something against the, uh, the, the prejudice according to which in, in nature we should find always functionality and perfection. So, why, according to Darwin, um, nature is full of useless um, things? Uh, this is a quotation by, from the original species, wonderful, the plain stamp of inutility in nature. Of course, because in nature you cannot find final causes. They are outside evolutionary explanation. Evolutionary explanation is related to mechanistic, to effective causes, not final causes in the future, because you can find many vestigial traits. So. Uh, unemployment, so the fact that in evolution you can have traits that are abandoned by evolution, so they, still, they are still there, they are tolerated by natural selection, and, but they are useless. And maybe in the future that could be reused for something new. I will show you some examples. Also, you can find many um, useless things in nature, also because in, in evolution you can find many side effects. For example, you can have an adaptation related to a part of an organism, the head or the beak of, of, of the finches and so on, and then you can have many side effects in other parts of the world, of the, of the body. The, um, the side effects are useless, but are tolerated because they are related to a very important adaptation. So many redundancies, okay? You can find many redundancies in, in, in evolution. And the, the, the idea that is very interesting is that according to Darwin and organisms, in us, it's not the machine composed by atomistic traits so that, that you can, that can split apart, but an organism is a system, so it's, it's a network of connections between parts. So if you change a part, you have to expect to have systemic, holistic 
uh, implications in other parts of the organism. A very modern idea that today we have rediscovered, and I, we, we know that he was right. So this is why you can find the origin species passages like, like this one. So we, we, not, we need not to be surprised if all the contrivances of nature are, are not perfect. Contrivances is another wonderful word in English because it means something ingenious but imperfect but something that, that can permit to find a solution, an effective solution anyway. So a contrivance is something through which you adapt to circumstances in a non-perfect way, but in, anyway, in an effective way. So contrivance is a crucial term in, in, Darwin, uh, in Darwin work. And also, this is important, this is a very important point, Darwin understood something that we know today is real, is true, that when we study nature, we find many imperfections, but our mind loves perfection. Our mind loves teleological explanation, finalistic explanation. This is a wonderful passage in which Darwin explains that it's scarcely possible to avoid comparing, to avoid for our mind, comparing the high to a telescope. So a natural object, a natural uh, trait of an organism, and something artificial. They are two di completely different things, but we try. We 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 we, are, we we have the tendency to conflate them. We know that this instrument has been perfected by the long continued efforts of the highest human intellects, the telescope. So it's an artifact, and we naturally infer that the high has been formed by a somewhat analogous process. It's wrong, but it's a it's a continuous tendency that we have in our mind. This is very important today because we know that it's true that we that the evolution explanation is counterintuitive, that it's a hard word that but means that it's against our common sense. So it's hard to, to reach these ideas. Also because it's finally final point in Darwin, very important that we we have this idea to personify nature. So we think that nature is a person with intention, with directions, with goals. But this is not true. Nature is a great system of which we are a part. So it's, it's, uh, it's made by laws, connections, relationships. It's, it's a great system. It's not a person with finalistic attitudes. So the main point, it will be my first point, then I will try to explain to you why Darwin was right and why today we think that nature has to be full of imperfection. This is the most, I think, the most radical idea that we, um, we that the most important legacy from Darwin. So it's the idea that it's impossible to find in nature any kind of ideal type, any kind of essence, any kind of standard, norm. According to Darwin, what you can find in nature is just diversity. Diversity at each level, at every level of observation, but mainly diversity at the individual level. And I think that this is very important even today for our times where we, we have some problem in understanding diversity. According to Darwin, it's impossible to find in nature two plants, two animals, two human beings, two cells that could be considered equal and identical. So why? Because each individual, his bearer of carries diversities, carries di di differences. And this is why perfection is, an, is, an, is not a good guide in order to understand evolution. Because what you observe in evolution is the imperfection of the di individual diversities that are the fuel of any change, the fuel of any, of any creativity in nature. I think it's a good idea also for other fields. So now, very briefly, why we, how can we propose a theory of imperfection? What are the roots of imperfection? I will propose a couple of three roots, and then we share something, and then I, 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 I'm, I'm going to, to give uh, room for your questions. One is this one. So the role of constraints in evolution. That's very important. This is a funny story that, that we can use in order to, to explain this idea, but believe me, now we, we know thousands of examples of this. This is an example proposed by Steve Jay Gould, a great evolutionist, uh, American evolutionist, working at the American Museum of Natural History and in Boston at the Harvard uh, Museum of Zoology. He was the mentor in my PhD, and, and, and this is a, a funny example of how of why imperfection can, uh, can, can grow in, in nature. Pandas, as you know, are 
bears, so they belong to the horsed group. They should be quite omnivorous. But the case of pandas is, is different because due to ecological changes two million years ago, they were separated by the other, the other species of the horsed family. And they had a radical change in the diet. And they, they became something like a vegan bear, okay? So just eating bamboos and eating in a very specialized way. So because they eat just some species of bamboos, some part of some species of bamboo. So it's a, it's a kind of adaptation that we call specialization in nature. Very risky, very risky because we, if you are too much specialized, you are vulnerable to environmental changes. Anyway, they survived. They are under threat, but due to human activities, not, not due to that. And what happened? It, happens, it happened that this, the organisms, the body of the pandas, had some rearrangements. So, for example, in the metabolic system, uh, in the movements, but also in the fact that a bear, for a bear, it's, it's absolutely impossible to grasp bamboos. How was possible to reach this adaptation? Using a, a, a small bone that we have, has as mammals here in the end, uh, exactly near to the thumb here, at the base of the thumb. And in pandas, this little bone has been reused in a creative, opportunistic way in order to produce a finger, another finger, an additional finger that we call a false thumb, the false thumb of the, of the panda. If you look in the photo, you see how now pandas are able to grasp the bamboos. Put the bamboos between the real thumb and the false thumb, they are able to grasp bamboos. Why this is a story of imperfection? Because of, because of course this invention is not optimal, absolutely non-optimal, but it's, it's enough. It's enough to survive. It's an example of a very frequent process in evolution through which you Instead of, use, of, of producing something completely new that would be very slow and would be very costly, in evolution, you take something already existing and you, you reuse the same structure for a completely different function. So something more economic, imperfect, but functional. So in this case, you have what we call acceptation, so a reuse of something already existing for a completely different function. And what is funny, is that now you don't see here in the photo, but we know that due to the fact that the genes that are producing the fingers in the hand are the same, uh, the, the same genes that produce uh, the fingers in, 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 the, in, in the leg, in the, in the foot, in, 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 in pandas foot you can find an additional uh, finger completely useless, okay? In the pandas you can find six fingers in all the four Limbs. So it's a strange story of re-adaptations, re-arrangements that we call in a metaphoric way tinkering or in French bricolage. It's like something like a bricolage using already existing structure for completely different functions. Again, Darwin was able in one of his final works and a, a wonderful masterpiece that quite no one read today. It's a book about the various contrivances, again, by which orchids are fertilized by insects. It's a, it's a small, wonderful book about evolution and co-evolution, co-adaptation. And according to Darwin, this would be the future explanation of evolution. So through how nature, almost every part of each living being has probably served in a slightly modified condition for diverse purposes and has acted in the living machinery of many ancient and distant specific forms. So evolution is the reuse completely of completely different structure for, for new function. So today we have this taxonomy that is very, very simple, very rapidly. So uh, adaptation is everything useful for fitness, for the survival and reproduction of organism. Adaptation when a feature, feature is directly crafted for a covering utility by natural selection, for example, the high. Acceptation is what else. So a future coped for the current utility by natural selection following an origin for a different function or for not function at all. So it's possible that in evolution you can have something more, something redundant, and then you can use this as a repertoire, as a reservoir for, for innovation. You can have many 
different examples of exaptation, the pandas, but also in the ichthyosaurus. For example, ichthyosaurus are were when wonderful animals. They were reptiles, so with the body plan of a reptile, with many constraints of the, of the skeleton of reptile, but exactly as in the case of dolphins and whales, they readapted their body for oceans. And so they were able to rearrange a reptilian, a reptilian body plan for a completely different uh, uh, condition, for a different environment. So evolution is opportunity, okay? It's an ingenious way to readapt yourself to different conditions. You can also have acceptation at the behavioral level. For example, this is a black, the African black heron that learned to reuse wings for hunting, for catching fishes, fish. So he, he, it creates a shadow in the water, and in this way, he's able to see the fish when he's approaching the shadow to the re through the reflection of the light, and he catches the fish. And it's, it's great because other predators in the water understood this strategy, and they collaborate with the black heron in order to, to push other fish in the shadow, and then can, they can catch the fish together. So it's, uh, it's another strange case of collaboration and, and imperfection that works. So again, this is the taxonomy, and this is one of my con scientific contributions that has been published in Nature. So acceptation means that you can use something for that before was useful or that before had no function at all. So for example, we know today that the evolution of wings and feathers, and, and so all the system of quills and feathers was a, an acceptation in the sense that today we know that birds today are dinosaurs. So birds are direct descendants from dinosaurs because we know that three families of dinosaurs survived the catastrophe of 66 million years ago. They were already able to use wings for completely different function with respect to flight. So for thermoregulation, sexual selection, oh, I have no time to go into the detail, and then they were able to use wings with feathers for flight, before for, for gliding from the, from the trees and then for the complete fly, so the, the conquer of a new uh, great ecological niche. So it's a wonderful example of a reuse of an already existing structure for a completely different function. Of course, human body, our body is a compendium of acceptations and imperfections. We have, we still have a quadrupedal structure, but a quadrupedal structure readapted for a bipedal behavior, for a bipedal locomotion. This is a wonderful piece published in Science some years ago. The title is very clear, so the burdens of being a biped. And this, in, in the red circles, you can find some of the imperfections that are due to this rearrangement of our anatomy we are the only animal in the world that has the most delicate organs without any defense exactly in front of the body. We are the only animal with such a great head with this neck, with its short neck. We are the only animal with these strange uh, adaptations. Uh, consider, for example, the, pro the, the pelvic prolapse that, that gives to humans this very hard and, and, and painful Delivery, completely nonsense in evolution. Why? Because it's a, it's a, it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off between different pressures. So the growth of our, of our body, of our brain, the restriction of the delivery channel, because you have to be bipedal, so you cannot enlarge too much uh, the, the, the channel. So at the end, we have a delivery process that is completely unfunctional, completely very dangerous and painful, and we tolerated it. But it's absolutely imperfect, no sense in evolution. So why? Again, because we are re-adaptations. We are rearrangements of already existing structures. So we are full of constraints. That means that we are full of history, because constraints come from history, from previous history. Even in the case of bipedalism also, we know that to, to work on, on our legs was not related to movement or to, um, to the fact that we can carry, we can have our arms free to carry 
objects, but it, it was in the beginning an adaptation for thermoregulation, so a completely different function, and then reused for many other functions, so carrying objects, foraging, and, and so on. So again, evolution is opportunity taken. Uh, this is one of the most important Italian Nobel Prizes, uh, um, Rita Levi Moltancini, neuroscientist, and also in this case, you have another one of examples, so even our brain has a set of bricolage, so a tinkering of old and new parts. And we think today, neuroscientists think today, that quite no part of our brain has evolved for the function that is served today. We can continue to reuse already stinted areas, existing areas for completely different functions. For example, with speech, we use areas for language that previously was related to sensory motory functions and so on. So our brain evolved to a tinkering of old parts with new parts. This is a French quotation by Francois Jacob exactly uh, saying the same, another Nobel Prize, a wonderful Nobel Prize in medicine, in French Nobel Prize, saying exactly that our brain has a, a, a bricolage of old parts for new function. This is a crazy example published in, in neuroscience, in natural neuroscience some years ago, in which you can sadly find some consequences of this, of this imperfection in our brain. It's a wonderful experiment in which the, uh, the, the mission of the volunteers uh, um, participating to the experiment was just to see uh, the face of a man, of a woman with a different phenotype, for example, belonging to another group. For example, if you have a white man or a white woman as a volunteer to see the face of an Afro-American woman or man or Asian or Native American or with all the possible combinations. So it, it was uh, indifferent. And every time if you, if you put uh, the fMRI in the brain and you see in a direct vision what happens in our brain during this job, during this, this, this uh, um, activity, you see two very hold areas of the brain that are activated immediately. So the fusiform, the gyrus fusiform that is related to the recognition of, of uh, faces, this is trivial. And also the amygdala that is related to the evaluations of possible threats. So anxiety, sense of, of danger, immediately, in a very instinctive, rapid way. But a third of second later, you see the activation of the neocortical areas, so much more modern parts of the brain, that tries to modulate and regulate the early reaction of the brain. So we have seen, for the first time, something like a conflict in the brain between the old parts of the brain and the more modern part of the brain. In Italy, I don't know, in the United States, uh, 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 the second part of the experiment, so the activation of the unocortical areas doesn't happen because, I, because for other reasons, okay? So in this case, you have a situation in which the final decision, the final perception of our brain will be imperfect will be, because it will be due every time to a conflict between antagonistic part of the brain. So this is a possible consequence of, of the imperfection of our brain. So again, always ambivalence. So imperfection means that you can be very creative, but also that you can be very imperfect in your behavior, in, in your reactions. This is another example, very briefly. Uh, it's an example of reuse of a gene that in evolution has been used for the uh, production of muscles and, and, so, and bones, so very basic function, that later in evolution, in primate evolution, has been used for the uh, development of brain and the neural uh, structure. So we continue to reuse even genes already existing for new functions. So today we think that this is exactly the reason why our brain is so plastic, is so flexible. So this is why we can read and write with a brain that has more than 200,000 years, that it's impossible that evolve for reading and writing. So new functions, new selective pressures are um, related to uh, old uh, 
uh, already existing structures. This is also why uh, it's our intelligence is so unpredictable. So, and this is why our brain continues to discover completely unexpected things. This is one of the themes that I, I, I decided to, to, to deal with in my next book that will be published by MIT Press next year in October, uh, Serendipity, so the unexpected in science. This is a wonderful dialogue invented by Gregory Bateson and try to answer the question. And it's a simple question, but it's absolutely hard to answer. So. I once knew a little boy in England who has got his father. Do fathers also always know more than sons? Of course, yes. And father replied, yes, of course. Then the little boy asked, dad, who invented the steam engine? And the father, James Watt. And then the son replied to him, why didn't James Watt father invent it? Try to answer the question. It's very difficult. If you, if you are able to answer this question, maybe you can understand what is serendipity, because it's impossible to answer, this, to answer this question, to reply to this question, because it's exactly related to the unpredictability and uh, creativity of our, of our brain. A final example about that, it's, it's great, proposed by, again, Steve J. Gould. It's a wonderful example of an imperfect adaptation, very imperfect adaptation, that has been crucial for our lives. Uh, we call it neoteny. Neoteny means that in some species, in very rare cases, you, you, an adaptation could be that of slowing down the development. We are one of the few species in the world that has prolonged in an unprecedented way childhood and adolescence. And we are among the few species that, that in, in which the juvenile traits remain for all over our lives, for the in adulthood. The, the metaphor is the Mickey Mouse, because in the Mickey Mouse you see exactly this evolution from a rodent model, so an animal model in the first, in the first um, draft, and then the evolution through a more child, child similar um, um, structure. And this is, this is great because this, is, was, this, is, this was a very imperfect adaptation because in this way you have, ch you have child very vulnerable, completely depending on parents and groups for much more time, for many, many years. So it's, it was very costly, very expensive, and very dangerous. But exactly like in the case of brain, like in the case of the evolution of our language, this fragility, this imperfection, has been crucial for the production of cultural evolution, learning, for game, for the prolongation of the period in which your brain are absorbing ideas and knowledge. So I know it's something contradictory, but this imperfection has been exactly at the base of our creativity and our success in evolution. Um, another example, and I am, I'm going to finish and to, to give the floor to you, is even more radical, because we discovered today that in many cases, in evolution, you can find many structures with a lot of things completely useless that are tolerated by evolution. One funny example here is the fact that many species have a huge size for, for the genome. For example, the onion has five times uh, a DNA that is five times larger than ours. And of course, in this case, it's impossible to explain such, such an amount of DNA with all the respect to the, to the onion, of course. It's impossible to connect this DNA to intelligence or adaptability or what else. Of course, it's useless. It's something more that we don't need. So in this case, I'm going faster. Uh, this could be right. This is something written by a, a great Nobel Prize, Sidney Brenner. Uh, who worked with Francis Crick about DNA. And he said in this paper that one of the most important structure and most complex structure that we see in evolution, so DNA, it's uh, something with a lot of two kinds of rubbish. One is what we call in English, we don't have the same distinction in Italian or in other, in other languages. One is the, uh, the, the junk that we throw away. And this is garbage. In evolutionary terms, it means a, a, a garbage that is costly and natural selection clean away, clean away this part. But also we have some other kind of rubbish that we call junk 
that could be armless or and even useless, but is tolerated by natural selection and is still there. So we call it junk DNA, like the, the people that, that, that continues to, to keep in the garage all things. And to the, to the question, why are you keeping all this stuff? The answer is because who knows? In the future, it could be useful. This is junk. This is not garbage, OK? So in this case, it could be just a metaphor. But then, after this intuition, we discovered that it was exactly true. And many years later, we discovered that exactly like in the case of the answer, who knows? Because the junk DNA we discovered recently, you see the title, genes from the junkyard. The junkyard was not, was not exactly a junkyard. It was a, a repertoire for innovation. It was something more useless now, but that could be possibly reused in the future for future innovation. This is an example of a new, very functional gene that as being produced by natural selection coming from the junk DNA. And we know also a story related to viruses, because today we discovered that a part of this junk DNA that we consider completely useless because it, it's been introduced in our genome by a virus, a retrovirus, has been reused in evolution for the production of the connection between the placenta and the mother. So, something completely useless in its origin has been creatively reused in evolution for something very important. This is the creativity of evolution. So using something redundant for something new in a creative, creative way. Finally, and I, I'm going to conclude with some more related to environmental issues, but it's, this is one, one, another, another reason for imperfection. And it's related in this case not to constraints, not to redundancy, but to the relationship between a species and its environment, mainly in the case of humans in this case. Why? Because we are, we as humans, we are in a strange situation today. We are in a situation in which we changed in the past millennia in a very radical way our environment. And we know, okay, through culture, technology, so in a good way, but also through the impoverishment of, of ecosystems, destruction of biodiversity, um, predation of, of resources, and so on. Okay? So anyway, independently of the value that you, 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 you give to the activity, we change it in a radical way, the environment. So what, are, what, what is happening today? What is happening today is that ourselves, uh, we have to adapt to a, an environment that we change it in a completely different way. So today, we are imperfect also because we suffer something like a jet lag with respect to evolution. Because in many cases, we have very old adaptations in our, in our body. For example, we know today, and we are sure about that because we discovered exactly the genes for that, that our metabolic system is still related to a way of diet to a weight of eating that is absolutely anachronistic today. We have a metabolic system that is still uh, related to a fragmented diet in, in, in a situation it, in, in which it was absolutely uncertain when you, you will have another possibility to, to eat, to have food, to find food. So we try to storage everything in, in when you have it. This is one of the genetic reasons for the pandemic of obesity, for example, and it could be related to many other diseases. So we call it evolutionary mismatch. So we have a body that is evolving in a slow way, but the environment in the meantime changed very rapidly. So now we have a jet lag between our slow adaptations and the environment outside. And this is true also because Maybe you know this metaphor, it's another literary metaphor. I, I love to use literature to explain science. This has been proposed by a colleague of mine, Leit Van Balen. Maybe you know this passage in the Lewis Carroll, Lewis Carroll to the Looking Glass in the second chapter, in, in which the Red Queen is running, running faster and faster. And Elias is asking to the, to the Red Queen, why are you running so fast? And the answer by the Red Queen is, don't you see that the environment outside is running, is moving? So if you want to, to appear stable, 
it, with respect to, the, to this environment, you have to run. And if you want to move with respect to this environment, you have to run faster and faster and faster and faster. This is a metaphor of what happens in evolution. Change, the environment outside is changing, and we have to run faster in order to stay at the same level of, of adaptation. But what is the problem today? Is that we are changing the environment in a too rapid, too drastic way. For example, in the case of diseases, in the COVID-19, I'm, I'm, it's a pity that we are forgetting the evolutionary deep reasons for the pandemics. You see in this map, for example, that, of course, pandemics always happened in the past, in, from the Neolithic era, because it, they depend on our connection with animals bearing pathogens like viruses and, and, and bacteria. But in this map, this is, this is a paper published also by, by Tony Fauci here in the United States. You discover that in the last 40 years, the pandemics grows in an in a accelerated way, in an exponential way. So something new happened. What happened? What happened is that we created what we call human ecological niches. And you see the list, OK? So wet markets, intensive farming, climate change, and so on and so on. Rubber tires related to the transmission of mosquitoes from different parts of the world. All these anthropic niches are places in which the pandemics grows the likelihood to, to, to appear, to emerge. So look at this situation in an evolutionary perspective. We are changing the world for our business, for our advantage. But changing the world, we are creating ecological niches for other species that, in this case, are enemy of us, that can attack us. So in this case, we are changing the world in a negative way with our adaptation. So finally, this is my met favorite metaphor. I love beaver. Beaver is my, my uh, special species because beaver is an ecosystem engineer. So he's a, he's a technologist, he's wonderful. He's a mammal able to produce wonderful technologies that are the beaver dams. The beaver dams are a technology through which beavers has, have an advantage in terms of reproduction and survival, of course, but they change the world. They actively change the world because they change the stream of water, they create new ecosystems, they are able to promote biodiversity because they change the world. We are exactly like beavers, but we are beavers out of control today. So we are beavers that decided to change too rapidly the, the world. So now you, you can approach the same climate change with the same metaphor. We are beavers under, out of control. Because what is climate change? Climate change is a global evolutionary experiment. I know that it's quite cynical to say that, but we evolutionists, we, we try to take a perspective, non-anthropocentric non perspective. So it's a, it's a way through which we are changing the global environment, the global ecosystem, the biosphere. We are changing the global parameters of climate change toward um, warmer situations. This happened, also, this happened also in the past, because the, the planet Earth has been colder and, 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 and has been in very radical situation with respect to this one. But today, we are the cause of this change, and we are changing the world for the other species, but also for, for us. And we have a problem, mainly, not only plants and animals, because we were and we are strongly adapted to the stability of the previous climate, because our civilization um, flourished in a very narrow range of climate conditions. So now, if we change this climate condition, we will have a problem of adaptation. So finally, these are, in conclusion, my, uh, this is my theory of imperfection that MIT Press decided to publish and that I publish in, 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 in many papers. So I, I tried to share with you just some of them anyway. Contingency of history, trade-off between different forces, constraints, the law of recycling, so acceptation, the onion law, so redundancy, so you, you use redundancy as a source of innovation, and the Red Queen law, that is the most 
said law of imperfection when environment runs faster than us, we suffer evolutionary jet lag. So this will be my idea to, to present to you some aspects of evolution that you can find in the imperfection in natural history. So thanks so much, and now I'm, I'm going to uh, listen to you. Uh, please raise your hand if you have a question, and we'll give you the microphone. Uh, you have a microphone in, in your side. This is, a, <laughs> this is an interesting innovation. I have a gentleman with a question right here. Thanks for your lecture. It's really illuminating in so many ways, I think. My question is, what is, what is your personal outlook about the race between man's impact upon his world and the ability of man to adapt? And I'm thinking not just physically, but societally and perhaps even psychologically in a collective way. Thank you. Yeah, this is a crucial question, of course. Because what we are observing from an evolutionary perspective, so my perspective is the perspective of what we call deep time, okay, is that in the future we have to expect that our evolution will be much more related to cultural changes and technological changes, changes in our so society, so social organization, as you say. But what we see today is the acceleration of the change. And so with unpredictable pace, you, we, we call it the great acceleration. Because if you, we know that, of course, climate change has deep roots in the past. We can also say that the Anthropocene uh, began with the Neolithic era, and this is true. But if you look at the curves of, if you look at the impact of humans on Earth, what you see is after the Second World War, so in the last 75 years, everything changed. And you see the great acceleration of the impact of humans of Earth. And the, the Second World War is three human generations, in my case. Me, my father, my grandfather, and then have my sons and, my, and, and the next generation. So four, five generations. It never happened in the past to see such a great change in the, in the relationship between a species and an environment in such a rapid way. So what is worrying is the evolutionary gap between the slow timing of biological evolution and the incredibly high speed of, of, of this change. We cannot come back to the previous conditions. We have to, to go, go ahead, and this is another problem, of course. You, maybe you know that, uh, I don't know in the United States, but in the what we call the, the Global South, this is another topic for future conferences for global humanities, there's a very interesting debate about the fact that may, maybe also the, the word Anthropocene is wrong. Why? Because the, the, the word Anthropocene seems to say that the, 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 the problem is related to the Anthropos in a general sense, so the human species. But this is not true, because it's related just to the Western part of the, of the humanity. And so maybe we have to find another, another term in order to be more precise about, about what happened in these three, four generations. So I'm, I'm, I'm not, I have no answer to your question, because by, by we are in a, what we call a bottleneck. So we are going through a very narrow passage, and we have to be very wise, and we have to be very, we have to, to cultivate foresight. So we have to do something more in order to have positive effects for the future generations. And for our mind, this is a great challenge because we have a mind that is not adapted to foresight. We have a mind that is adapted to find solutions here and now when we see exactly the implication and consequences of our actions. So it's a challenge for our evolution, for our brain. But I'm still optimistic because if you, just let me say that if you see serendipity, serendipity for me is a great reason for hope. Why? Because today in my university, in every university, I, I work in the Department of Biology, now I'm working on technologies like gene editing or what else, that my mentors in the United States 20 years ago never imagined they were unable to imagine what we have discovered today. 
So I have to, to think exactly the same for my students that now are in my classes in the university. I have to think that in their eyes, in their brains, there's something completely unexpected that I cannot imagine and that I hope that can help us to, to find solutions to the great problem that we have. Oh, I'm almost there. I can't spread. Here you go. I was waiting. Oh, what? My name is Callie Rawson, and I'm a sound healer here in Maine. Um, my company is called Sacred Frequencies, and I'm all about humanity and um, bettering the future. So I'm asking you, as an evolutionary, what can we do as a community? What kind of behaviors can we start to adapt in this small community? And then start to take that behavior and pass it on, kind of like coughing like this instead of coughing like this. What could we do to help the evolution yeah. of our planet? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, the same question has been put to a great climatologist some months ago. I, I, I was in an international conference and this was from the Potsdam Institute of Climate Change, one of the most important research centers in Europe. And he answered in a very strong way that, that, that struck me. He answered, we have to do everything. In every lines of our activity, of our human activity. What, what he meant, it, he, he meant that in the past, in the last few years, we thought that we were still in time to find priorities, so lines of activities more effective in order to find solution to this problem. Today, we have no time, so we have to, in order to avoid a situation very hard to solve, like in the case of more than two degrees or 2.5 degrees of, of climate warming, we have to try to um, uh, find actions and solution in every line of our activities. That means energy production, transports, uh, industries, uh, diet, for example, so consumption of, of meat and so on. So we have to do everything, not in a radical way, but in a rapid way that is different. So we have not to come back to, and to come back to poor situation. We have to change in an innovative way. And we have many examples about that, that we, positive examples about that. For example, today we have still some problem with the ozone layer. Maybe you know the story. You remember when in the past we discussed for a long time about the problem of the rarification of the ozone layer. In 25 years, we were able to solve quite completely the problem. Now the problem is still there for other reasons. Now I don't want to go into the detail. But in 25 years, we were able to solve for 80% the problem. Why? Because we wrote a protocol in Montreal in 1987. The protocol has been signed by quite all the nations. We discovered the causes. We, are, we were able, from a polit political point of view, to say to the companies, four companies involved, great company, international companies, to change the industrial production. Do you remember the refrigerant gases, the causes? They did it, and we solved the problem. Without the loss of, of employment, without economic problems, but instead producing technological innovations growth and more development. So it's possible to have a green transition in a positive way and not in a negative way. I think this is, this is very important to share with people because in Italy, in Europe, people are so worried about the fact that, okay, we have to do the ecological transition, but it will be costly, it will be dangerous, it will be that we have to come back to our values. We, my father, my, my grandfather uh, had periods of great wealthy and now we have to come back. No, it's not, this is not the narrative that we have to share. We have to share another narrative. We have a problem. This problem could become a great opportunity for innovation, for technology, for changing. This is what evolution teaches us. We have to be creative and transform a problem into an opportunity. That's my, my idea. Please. 
I have a slightly more philosophical question, but there is no imperfection without perfection. So how do you define perfection um, as the standard that you are doing in this work? Yeah, that's a very good point. I had no time to discuss about that in a philosophical term. Of course, imperfection is a negative term. So it's the denial of something already that we have already in mind. We define in evolution perfection in two ways. One is the structural perfection. So, for example, if you look at the structure of an eye, of, of the wings of the albatross, so you can clearly observe many pieces, many components, all organized together. This is the structural perfection. Never completed, never, never really true in every, in every sense, but this is what we call and we think is structural um, perfection. In the other way, we think that perfection is in terms of beauty, in terms of our perception of the organization of the structure. So a more aesthetical idea of perfection. So structural or aesthetical is our two classical way to think about perfection in, in biology. For example, we can think that the wonderful ornaments in the displays of many birds is something that we can consider perf perfect in, in the second sense. The idea is that this is very rare. It's very rare that you can find such kinds of perfection in nature. And this is why Darwin tried to explain why this is, this is so rare. If you understand why it's so rare, you can, un you can understand how evolution really works. So that's the point. Anyway, of course, we can find in nature many very, very beautiful structures. But if you look exactly within the structure, we will discover a lot of imperfections. In the case of the high, for example, our high is very imperfect. You know that the high evolved more than 32 times independently in the evolution of animals. Why? Because, of course, there was a strong selective pressure for the orientation in the space, recognitions of light and dark, uh, so movement in the space, then recognition, perception of colors, three-dimensional objects, and so on and so on. So very, very strong functionality for, for having highs and, be, and have orientation in the space. So more than 30 times evolved in a parallel way. If you look from a biomechanical and functional perspective, the most perfect high in the world is the high of the octopus. Okay. And we, and then also many other uh, animals, birds, and so on, and not the human high, because the human high is a rearrangement of our radius existing structures again. So we have the invention, inversion of the image, we have the black hole, we have many imperfections that you cannot find in other animals. So look at the octopus if you like to see what an high should be. <laughs> I have oh, I have a question online. Somebody who was watching this, your ah, talk, okay. you know, sure. remotely. It's not like I have my own question, but that is a question online, from Matt in Portland, Maine. In your personal view, how has studying imperfection affected your understanding of life and existence? Oh, in many ways, I I I, I could say that it was the reverse process that because because I discovered imperfection trying to find something um, in order to explain how evolution really works. And when I was trying to explain to people, also in my project of science communication, because I'm strongly involved in many projects of science communication in Italy, in Europe, with museums, exhibitions, and so on. And I tried to, to find an example in order to challenge this bad idea that you can find in many docufilms not, not today. Today is less than in the past. But in the past, uh, you can, could also see nature. OK, the representation of an ecosystem in terms of harmony, equilibrium, everything is in the right place. The predators are doing the predators. The prey are doing the prey. Everything is in the right place. But studying the ecosystem and evolution, you discover that this is not the case. Evolution is disharmonic, is, is, is not exactly in the equilibrium. You, in, in evolution, there's a general law. Where you can find equilibrium, you can find death, not life. 
equilibrium is that. Life is this equilibrium, changes, redundancy, possibility of innovation, unpredictability, this is life. And so this is why I decided to use imperfection. So imperfection is a consequence of something philosophically already existing for me. Another example that, that I, just, uh, I just quote in the book is the, because I love also to remember great scientists that, that I don't want that has been, um, for, that we have to, to recognize, we have to be, um, to, to, to say thanks to the, to the scientists that discovered things that today are important. For example, one is Jim Lovelock, the proponent of the Gaia hypothesis, maybe you know Lovelock. He, he died uh, two years ago at the age of 102 in the Dorset in, 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 in Great Britain. And he was able to explain the planet Earth has a great system of relationships inspiring a lot of literature and, for example, Avatar Pandora, the plan has been exactly inspired by the Gaia hypothesis by Gene Lovell. But the first idea, the initial idea, was exactly when the NASA project asked Jim Lo a young Gene Lovell to try a criterion in order to distinguish observing external planets, possibly living planets, so a planet with life and planet without life. And Jim Lovelock ended up with an incredibly fruitful idea. If you look from the outside, the atmosphere of a planet and the surface of a planet, and this will be true also when, Lovelock said, when you will be able to observe planet outside the solar system. And today, we have an encyclopedia of observation of systems of planets that, that, that we call exoplanets, so planets belonging to other uh, solar system, and we confirmed this idea, the criterion will be, according to Jim Lovelock, if you look to a planet that is in equilibrium, don't care, don't, don't care about, is, is that. If you look at, at, to a planet in which, in the atmosphere, in atmosphere, there are strange gases, something non in equilibrium, Look at this planet because there is a possibility that life is there. And today is exactly what we are doing in the NASA project. So life is present when you see something moving and some gases like oxygen or nitrogen in the atmosphere where they don't have to be there. So something changing things. So this is a very profound idea of life for me. Life is something continuously changing. Okay, so at the age of chaos, at the age of disorder, as Stuart Kaufman said in the Santa Fe Institute. So this is my question. Now, having read your book, in, somewhere in your book you talk about the fact that, uh, that there's all this mechanism and this tinkering that's happened uh, for the sake of evolution, or maybe it's devolution, uh, where it, the, the aim is it, it's only valid during the reproductive age. But then after that, as people know, there's this huge mania for like longevity in, in all of our societies. Everybody wants to live forever, forever, forever. But the body has its limits, you say. You know, after, after the reproductive age, it cannot, you cannot avoid those ailments and, and pains and uh, sorrows that come along with aging. So how do we reconcile this, this mania for longevity in our culture and the, the limitations of the body? Yeah, good point. I don't know in the United States. In Italy now, it's uh, really a mania. In, in, I don't know about, about not longevity, but it's different, the possibility of immortality. We have a debate in Italy. We want to, be, to live forever. And of course, according to evolution, this is not possible. According to evolution, I don't know if you are happy about that, but we have around 120 years, we have a structural limit. Uh, for surviving for human beings. So 120 years is not so, so bad anyway. But the problem is to reach this age in a, with a quality of life, not just to reach by itself. But the point, two points. One is about reproduction. Uh, this is another great misunderstanding about evolution because you can find in many books that evolution is just to reach reproduction because you, in this way you can transmit your genes to the next generation. This is true, of course. But in order to be reproductive, you have to survive. So evolution is not just a matter of genes and reproduction, but it's a matter of relation with an environment. 
social environment, physical environment, biological environment. So you have to survive, you have to interact with the environment in a good way, and in this way you can reach the reproductive age and you can live your genes to the next generation. So survival and reproduction, interaction and reproduction, not just reproduction. Because in many books you can find, okay, we have to reproduce and everything we do is just instrumental for, uh, for reproduction. This is a very reductive way to think about evolution. I'm thinking, of course, about the selfish genes by Richard Dawkins and many literatures like this. We know today that evolution is an ecological theory. It's not just a genetic theory. I work in the Department of Genetics, so I, I, I'm not saying that genetics is not important, but the theory of evolution is an ecological theory. And ecology means interactions, relationships. Okay, it's a theory related to relationships. If you look at the end of Darwin's Origin of Species, the, all, the, all the final pages are related to ecology. So Darwin is writing, see the connection between birds, flowers, and, and animals. If you change a, a point in this network, you have another change in another point. So systems, relationships, networks, this is the, the right way to think about evolution. Second point, longevity is something different with respect to immortality. and, and I say, I think that it's something like, a, in, in a Greek term, ubris. So it's the idea that we have to continue to overcome every limit. This is human. This is typical of our species. We did it since the beginning. If you look at the human history, we, we have bird, we, 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 we are born in Africa 200 millennia ago, and, and quite immediately after, we decided to go out of Africa, to migrate out of Africa, to change ecosystems. And even in the early stages, you see that when humans arrive, ecosystem changes. Ecosystem change. You have a reduction of biodiversity. You have a changes. You have changes in landscape. So we are a performative species, always trying to overcome our limits. So I don't think that this is not human. But we, you should, in a period of environmental crisis, we should think better about the limits that we have in our relationship with the environment, in our survival. And if you look at all the possibilities that some scientists um, think about our immortality are very elusive. Because clonation, for example, is not immortality. Because we know today that if you have a clone, the clone is not you. The clone is another individual. A clone is someone with the same DNA that you have, but today we know that DNA is regulated, modulated, changed. We have the epigenetic markers. We have the environment. DNA is sensible to the environment. So a clone is not us. So it's not a way for the immortality, OK? It's a way to produce another self, but with a different, with a different life. So and, and you can check every technology proposed for immortality and is, is is elusive. So I'm not saying that it's not a good a good line of research, but we have to think about longevity and quality of life, not about immortality for me. Well oh, there's one more one more right here. I'm curious of your opinion about humans Tinkering. Uh, my exam. I, I just watched uh, the thing on the buffalo that uh, Ken Burns did. We're bringing the buffalo back. Uh, we had long conversations about, or, or experiments and stuff about bringing the wolf back and that sort of thing. What's your opinion about humans tinkering with with these sorts of uh, situations? Yeah, that's a good question. I did. I I, I discuss about this in another in another book. I'm I'm quite quite critical, but I, I think, again, it's natural for us to try to, try to do it. Um, now I'm studying, maybe you know this line of research that is quite crazy, but they are quite approaching the point the, that we call de-extinction. So the fact that we, we are, that now, thanks to gene editing, we will be able to de-extinct, to resurrect uh, an extinct species. Um, like in the case of mammoths or thylacine in Australia or the migratory birds in, 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 in other cases. Of course, a species recently extinct 
because in this case we have the DNA, we had a complete sequence, and thanks to the gene editing we can not use the clonation that was very costly and very ineffective, but today we can try to change the DNA of an already exist, of an extinct species close to the species that we want to resurrect. In the case of mammoth, for example, the Asian elephant, you can take the DNA of the Asian elephant and you can try to transform this DNA in a mammoth DNA. Because we have the two sequences, you can overlap the sequences, and thanks to the gene editing, you can transform one into another. And then you can try to the fecundation of, of, of an egg and try to uh, create a, 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 a mammoth or something like an elephant with mammoth uh, mm, mm, traits. So again, it's not a resurrection. It will be, because I'm sure that they will do it. It will be, I don't know if you will to visit the garden, the zoological garden with these new creators. I will do it because I'm very curious, but I'm also very critical because it's a very expensive technology. It's not a matter of resurrection. We will, we will produce a hybrid species, not, not so something new. We don't know how. We don't know if this animal will have uh, immuno, immuno defense for the new environment in which we will uh, put it. So it's a very risky technology, but I have to say, frankly, in, with honesty, that in other cases in the past, we tried to do some, something very strange that was, at the end, quite useless. But during the process, we discovered something very, very interesting. So I'm, I'm in a contradictory situation. Let me give you another example. In California now, um, Craig Venter, uh, is doing other wonderful things in, in, in the synthetic biology. I don't know if you, if you look at the film. In synthetic biology, for example, Craig Venter was able to produce a cell, the code was SYNC 3.0, a cell with a minimum genome. So a cell starting with the genome of, uh, of a, a microbe of, of, of our gut with 1,000 genes, and he was able to produce a cell with less than 500 genes. So for the first time, we have in the lab a cell, so an organism, a new species that doesn't exist in nature with such a teeny, such a small DNA. And now they are trying to add new genes in order to domesticate this synthetical organism, in order to make this organism do useful thing for us. For example, reducing pollution in the cities or remediation when you have um, uh, oil in, 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 in the sea or something like that. Of course, this is considered a very risky technology because we don't know what we will happen, what will happen when we will delay, when we will put these organisms in the, in the environment. But I have to say that thanks to this discovery, thanks to this technology, we are discovering incredibly interesting things. For example, we discovered that in such small genome, 500 genes, each gene is absolutely fundamental for the organism. Otherwise, if you, are, if you, if you uh, uh, take off one of these genes, the cell is unable to survive. But for more than 140 of these, gene, of these genes, we don't know what they are doing in the cell. So we discovered that we are so ignorant about how the DNA, even of a very simple cell, is working. And we discovered that, thanks to Craig Venter, this very criticized technology. So the paradox is, if we don't manipulate, we don't discover. If we manipulate, we can discover something dangerous. So this is, this is the paradox of any technology in the case of that you ask. So I have no, no answer also in this case. Just well, new questions well, and new we, doubts. Now, we don't, we're running out of time. So thank you so much for, for attending tonight. And uh, what a delightful event. Thanks to you.